Well, we are in Bangkok for Traders Carnival, and as is the norm in Bangkok, you got to be outside the Emerald Buddha to shoot something big. And we are shooting something big. We have the big guest of the event with us, James Dalton, or Jim, as he's popularly known. Jim, hi. Good to have you on the show. Thank you. Uh, so you've been with IBM. You were there for one and a half year before uh, you moved on to trading. You were the best salesman. What moved you to trading? Well, I don't know if I was the best salesman. I had a good track record, but it, my problem was IBM. Things didn't change, and I enjoy change on a regular basis. And the thing about trading, it's constant change. If there wasn't any change, there wouldn't be any opportunity. And, and it, the advantage is that most people don't like change. They want comfort. I enjoy change. Okay. So, you know, you've been associated with CBOE, with the Chicago Board of Trading. Uh, I mean, tell us about your experience in, 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 the, in, in the United States, uh, your experience with all these big exchanges, and how trading has changed from those years to now. Trading has changed considerably, but the basics haven't. The days when I first started trading, the center of most activity took place on the floor of an exchange. This meant buy, this meant sell on the floor. And most traders picked up clues or got an edge from hearing the sound. If the market took out yesterday's high and the noise level went up, that meant that the outside flow of orders was increasing and we were going higher. So those traders would keep bidding. If the outside flow of orders or the noise went down, they instinctively knew that it was over and we would trade lower. So the traders on the floor had a distinct advantage from being able to listen to the market. When we went to electronic trading, that advantage for most traders went away. It turned out, I believe, to be an advantage for the individual because they got more transparency. When we went to electronic trading, everybody can see it, what's it going on. It presented the level playing field to everyone. Well, it did initially. Yes. It did initially until all of a sudden we got into the world of, you know, fast trading. And then it became those that had the fastest communication got an edge. Uh, so change, change is constant and it's ongoing. Okay. So tell me one thing, uh, Jim. Uh, in your first few years of trading, did you lose a lot of money? Did you learn from those mistakes? I mean, how did you become an ace trader? I lost a lot of money. I lost quite often. I had to replenish my account on several occasions, and it's very humbling. Over time, you learn from experience, and you start to learn that if you organize the information better than the next person, you may get an advantage. And of course, that's what I did. And I'm known for my work with the market profile. And then the market profile is simply a graphical way to review a market. To make a graphic or to make a distribution curve, you need a constant and a variable. This is what scientists have done for years. The constant we figured out was time. A half an hour between 8 and 8.30 and 9 and 9.30 were one and the same. Tuesday's as long as Wednesday. So if you take time the constant against price of variable, you start to get a distribution curve. The distribution curve doesn't tell you to buy or sell. It's just a way to organize the data. Once you organize the data, now you have a better chance to interpret that information. Okay, you know, yesterday over dinner you were telling me that the big mistakes day traders make is they go after the trades uh, rather than coming that one big trade come to you. You want to explain that? The most traders are anxiously looking and trying to find a trade. And if you're trying to find a trade, you will probably find a trade, but it won't be the right trade. When traders, it takes a lot of maturity to understand that if you get into the flow of the market, when the trade is right for your time frame, you will recognize it. That's a very difficult concept and it takes some period of time. But when it comes to you, when you see the trade unfold in front of you, it's now your trade. You have the confidence and you're in control. Most people are just too anxious. Okay. The other thing that I want to discuss is how important is price when you're looking at trading? How important is volume? How much you trade? When do you trade? Timing, 
price, volume, what's the most important trigger? It's trading as a business. And like any business, whether it be General Motors or Unilever, you know, price is an advertising mechanism. Price advertises all opportunity. Time regulates that opportunity. And volume measures the success or failure of those opportunities. General Motors, Unilever, I mean, this is what they look at constantly. And it's the same concept with trading. Most traders don't understand that, and they chase price. And price is simply an advertising mechanism. Other thing that I want to discuss with you is that sometimes you talk about breakouts, right? Uh, uh, the, the price has broken out from yesterday's high. Is that a signal to buy or is that a signal to sell? I mean, do you look at volumes? Who's taking the market higher? Who's taking the market lower? How do you know that this is a breakout that I want to buy and this is a breakout that I actually want to sell? Well, everything is a series of facts surrounded by other circumstances. So, and it's an odds-based decision. If we break out of yesterday's high or break out of a trading range, if we break out of that range and the value volume decreases, more than likely, it's not going to be a successful breakout. If you break out of that range and you get more volume, so if volume increases, then you have a pretty good chance that you're going to get a successful breakout, at least to some degree. But it's the circumstances, and that's most people just look at price rather than understanding the surrounding circumstances. So, so let's talk about the, the, the recent past. Uh, where have you traded recently? I mean, do you trade U.S. equities? Dollar, currency, commodities, everything, whatever moves. What's your what's your best trade right now? Well, I have traded almost everything over the years, but now because I just announced my retirement a couple of weeks ago, I basically only trade the U.S. S and P 500 or the E mini, the small contract. A lot of our viewers watching us right now, they want to know what mistakes should they avoid to be successful. The ratio, as you said, is is quite low, but then. Whoever makes it, makes it big. So, what kind of mistakes should you avoid to become a successful trader? Well, sometimes somebody makes it big, but they don't hold on to it. So, it's a very important how you frame that. Just because they made it big, so many give it back very quickly. The three mistakes, the three biggest mistakes most traders make, short-term day traders. They trade too early in the morning. If you're within yesterday's range, you want to have patience, let the market chop. And if you're outside of yesterday's range, you may want to trade early because you're out of balance. So it's again, it's if you're in yesterday's range, you're fairly well in balance, you want to have some patience. If you're outside of yesterday's range, the chance for a big day are much higher. So the first mistake so many traders make is being too anxious to trade in the morning. Second thing they do is they trade too often. I look for two, maybe three trades a day. A lot of these traders are looking for five, ten trades a day. They, they have a false idea of what trading is. So the first trade is trading too early in many cases. Second trade is trading too much. And the third big mistake they make is putting their stops too tight. They believe that they're being prudent by having a tight stop, when in fact, they're not because when you add up a series of losses where you've got stopped out, you've got the loss itself, the spread between the bid and the offer, and all the transaction costs, and it gets quite, quite expensive. So, do you have any formula for stop? How 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 tight or how wide your stop should be? No, I don't. I, I it would it would be far too complicated to discuss right here. I use the market profile to identify market structure and I try and place my stops near some place that would violate the market structure and I believe that the best way to control risk is to understand market structure and where you should place your stop. The worst stop you can use is just a money stop saying I'll risk this or I'll risk that. That's just a random event and the second worst thing people do is they say okay they they have a trade and the trade starts to work. They psychologically move their stop to break even. And that sounds sensible to them. It's actually a terrible thing to do because it's random. 
you know, wh where they got in has no importance to the market. But those are the things people do to help defeat themselves. Okay, uh, so that's about the three big mistakes that uh, you should avoid. Uh, you would have interacted with a lot of traders who have been successful. You yourself have been an extremely successful trader. What is the biggest quality of a successful trader? The biggest positive quality? When I had a discount futures trading firm, I searched very hard to look for the traits of a successful trader. And it varies considerably. You have some traders that are very good at trading relationships. You have some traders that are very good at trading options. And then you have some traders that are, they just try and buy and sell. The ones that just try and buy and sell, and they don't have much of an edge. They need to understand the market. They need to understand who they are and trade, not what I would trade, not what you would trade, but what they're comfortable with. If they're not comfortable with the trade, then they're not going to have the confidence to stay with it. So preparation, we, we spend a lot of time telling people that they should prepare. They should prepare every day by looking at the monthly chart, monthly bar, weekly bar, daily bar, then the market profile. And each day they should spell out in writing three potential scenarios that could happen the next day. And, the, and then you've got a fighting chance. The worst trader is a trader that has only one idea. They may, may get lucky today, but there's too much randomness in the market. As you and I talked in the cab, it was very random that Warren Buffett came in and bought a, a billion dollars worth of Apple. You know, you don't know that's going to happen. And, and if you don't have contingency plans for the unexpected, now you're just lost. And now you're scrambling, and you do, when you scramble, you do some really silly things. Okay, now let's move to a slightly lighter side of things. Uh, trading is supposed to be stressful. It's supposed to be one of the most stressful jobs. Uh, uh, how do you relax? How do you take time out from, you know, such stress, stressing activity to sort of, you know, get the fun part or enjoy yourself? Well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I would say it's fun. It, but it is a question of relaxing. And one of the things that I do is I sit back. A lot of traders, you will find them hunched over their machine like this. I sit back. In fact, an individual that's a, a tennis pro uh, came one day to my house and he said, Jim, you're taking a landscape view, meaning I'm back taking a broad view. And that allows me to, to have a pretty good idea of what's going on overall. So many traders are over the machine like this. They're looking at ladders and bid and offer spreads, and their sight gets so narrow that they can't see the bigger picture. So by looking, by being relaxed and sitting back, I'm more relaxed and it's more comfortable. I wouldn't say fun, but more comfortable. Okay, so that's uh, how you sort of relax yourself during trading. But what else? I mean, what else do you enjoy in mean, life? I do a lot of fishing. Okay. I do a lot of fishing. It puts me on the river. It puts me on a lake. Uh, and I don't think about anything else when I'm doing it. Surprisingly, some of my best ideas come when I'm fishing. Okay. I'm not thinking about anything. It just, the mind is free. And all of a sudden, something will come to my mind. I do some writing. You know, I've got two books out there. And I write a newsletter. I don't anymore. But a lot of those ideas come when I'm not looking for the ideas. It's almost, you know, it's almost trend-like. You know, you just, you relax, and there it is. Tell me one thing, Jim. Uh, uh, from here on, where do you see life for you? I mean, you're 75 now. You've been... You've been an ace trader, you've been an ace salesman, you're retiring now, but uh, what next? I don't know, I like to read, I like to fish, we're going out, we're going to leave uh, shortly, we're going to take about a seven week road trip uh, through the western United States, up through California, Oregon, Wyoming, Montana, and then back down through Utah. So for right now, we're just going to get in the car, we're going to go, and then we've taken a couple of road scholar trips, which is a tour group. And we're just going to see what happens.